This episode is brought to you by Bulletproof Script Coverage, where screenwriters go to get their scripts read by top Hollywood professionals. Learn more at CoverMyScreenplay.com. I'd like to welcome to the show Gary Goldstein. How are you doing, Gary? I'm fabulous, Alex. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for, for coming on the show and, and dropping your knowledge bombs on our tribe today, sir. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. So uh, before we even get started, I need to, I need to bring something to your attention. Um, there was a film you made uh, that had a very big impact on my life, and it was called Cannibal Women on the Avocado Jungle of Death. Now, with that film, I was working at the video store in 1989. My, my audience is tired of me saying, oh, this video store. I, anytime I have a guest that impacted me during that time, I always bring it up. It was, it was 89, if I'm not mistaken, and that was a, a year into my, a year or a year and a half into my time spent at this video store. And I remember coming it, it came into the store and I said, oh my God, that's amazing. Who the hell made this movie? And my God, that's the greatest title of all time. Years later, I would always reference that title to people. I'm like, the 80s were crazy. They even made a movie called Cannibal Women in the Avocado Jungle of Death. <laughs> And it was like, and there was another one called Assault of the Killer Bimbos. And there was, and there was like, you know, girls, it was just insane. But I remember that those, those are the titles that I just stuck with me so much because that's such an amazing title. How did you get involved in that? How did that come to be? <laughs> it's actually a really fun story. So as you recall, because you were there at the time uh, in, you know, I, I, at the time when I moved to LA, I really didn't know a soul. I didn't know a, a lick about the business. Other than I had a dream, I was driving to L.A., whatever fit in my Carmen Ghia came with and everything else left behind. Uh, and within a year uh, or so, I came here in the early 80s and I formed, um, I, I was a self-defrocked attorney. I was a criminal defense attorney up in San Francisco. I did not want to be an attorney and I didn't know the job definitions of the film and TV business. But within a year or so, I learned, I found some mentors and friends and I ended up opening up a lit management company. I wanted to work with writers and directors. So I, so I formed a literary management company and it, you know, the first couple of several years were pretty rocky, uh, but I figured it out and it started to become a really good business and I really enjoyed it. And because I was new, my clients were unknowns with virtually no resume or little resume. Anyway, long story short, I'm going to start at the beginning. So I bought, uh, one of the first Mac computers in the 80s, and it came in a, you know, a box the size of a refrigerator, <laughs> but you couldn't plug it in. It didn't do anything. And so I, 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 I ran across it. I, I realized that a friend of mine, this woman, she was a screenwriter, and she was writing on one of these machines. And I said, how did you do that? Who programmed that for you? And she said, oh, call Jonathan. And I called this fellow Jonathan. He comes in. He's 23, really brilliant guy, very quiet. And he programmed, spends three weeks in my office programming this darn thing and did a brilliant job. And along the way, at the end, um, I, 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 I was asking him a bunch of questions and I learned he was a film school dropout. He'd written seven scripts. Not a human had read one of them. They were in his little one room studio apartment in the Rampart District of Hollywood. And I said, well, you know, listen, let me read one of your scripts and, and, and if I like it, I'll help you get an agent. Well, long story short, I read three and I said, forget the agent. You're good. I, I want to work with you. Uh, his name was Jonathan, but he's also known as J.F. Lawton. And he was the guy who, uh, amongst other things, wrote the script that became Pretty Woman. Um, so, you know, you never know where the good in the universe is coming from. Uh, anyway, so I, now I have I have a great client and I have a computer that works and <laughs> Uh, life is great and we're, 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 we're making hay, but I, um, um, uh, you know, we, we, we got to 1988 and the Writers Guild went on strike. So it shut all production down, film and TV. So there was really, we did, yeah, I didn't want to sit on my hand. So I went to Jonathan and I said, look, you've always wanted to direct. I think I want to flex my producing muscle, see if I've got a producing muscle. And, um, you know, dust off one of your college scripts. I'll go out and raise whatever I can. And we'll figure it out. You know, we'll be dumb and dumber. We'll go out and gorilla, uh, play like gorillas and make a movie. Anyway, long story short, so I went out looking for money. And I went to, um, if you remember, do you know Charlie Band? 
The name sounds familiar. Yeah, yeah, Charlie Band was the owner of a company called Empire Pictures. Oh. Uh, yeah. And it was like a B minus film company. Uh, to, I'm putting it mildly. Anyway, so he ran this operation. And the way they made films back then was he would put together this gorgeous artwork on a glossy fold over. He would have a film title. He would have images. He would have a paragraph summary of the story. And then he would have a credit block. And it turned out, I learned, I said, who are all these names in the credit block? And he said, oh, they're the names of all my wives, ex-boyfriends with their first and last names mixed up. I said, okay, fair enough. Uh, and he would take these to the different film markets, MIFED, AFM, et cetera. And if buyers bought it, he had the money to go make the film. And if not, he threw it in the trash. So I went to him to, to raise money and he laid out a bunch of these cards and he said, pick one. And I'm going to give you $200,000, whichever one you pick. And the titles were absolutely embarrassing. It was his space less in the slammer. Uh, he had one called Piranha Women. So I said, well, all right, I'm going to pick Piranha Women. And I said, uh, uh, you know, is, is, it, are, is that carved in stone or can I change the name? He said, you cannot change the name. That's my name. You may not change the name. And I thought about it. And I went, okay, but, you know, people might think we're taking ourselves seriously. So can I add words to the end of it? And he said, yeah, you can do that. So the film started as Piranha Women in the Avocado Jungle of Death until we got the lawyer letter saying, Charlie, band has stolen our title and you you can't use it. <clears throat> so it became Cannibal Women in the Avocado Jungle of Death. Um, and, you know, which, 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 <laughs> poor Joseph Conrad. We, we always said it was, it's a feminist spoof comedy based on Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness. But, <laughs> uh, you know, we, 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 we basically had a four week period before we were supposed to leave to uh, the Sundance Institute for their production lab on another project. I was going to say, and, don't tell me the cannibal women, the avocado jungle, no, the Sundance Institute. <laughs> not, not exactly. It was actually 3000, which was the, the yeah. early version of Pretty Woman. So we had four weeks and I said to Jonathan, well, 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 you know, let's make it when we get back. And he said, no, I don't want this hanging over our head. Why don't we make it before we go? And I said, yeah, that makes sense. Let's do it. So uh, we basically had, you know, two weeks of prep. We didn't have a crew until the second week. We realized we were missing something. Uh, and we shot it in 11 days and edited it for three and delivered it as as is. Uh, and uh, off we went to Sundance. But yeah, we we had um, we made every mistake known to man. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we had way too much fun. And then we had, you know, listen, we had Bill Maher and we had Shannon Tweed and we had Adrian Barbeau. It was a riot. We had a riot. And the funny thing is for people don't understand back then in the late 80s, early 90s, I mean, essentially all you needed to do was almost finish a film and it was sold. You would, I mean, yeah. if you just, if you made it past the finish line and delivered a movie, you're going to make your money back because there was just no competition. I remember watching everything that came out every week, like literally every film that came out every week, which was probably five or 10 on a really great week. But normally it's like two or three new releases every week. And one, right. one of those, one of those weeks was Cannibal Women and Avocado Jungle of Death. Fantastic. Now, now I can die in peace because now I know how, where that film came from. Yeah, I mean, it did make it to Paramount Home Video, so it was yeah. out on VHS and ultimately DVD, and then uh, it, I, I forget the platform, but it ran on. It actually ran on cable for like I don't know, fifteen years oh, or some crazy. It, it was a constant. It was a constant. It was always. Old. And by the way, just so you know, one of our best sellers, one of our best renters. I'm just letting you know, one of our oh. best renters. It was one of our best renters. Wow. Little mom and pop, little mom and pop shop that we uh, that I worked at was uh, it was anytime someone came in like, well that's gonna be fun. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, it would be like Predator and then Cannibal Women in the Avocado Jungle Death, and I'm like, watch one for for the action, watch the other one just to have a great time. Uh, and as long as you don't take it seriously, it's gonna be good. For, it's gonna be worth your dollar ninety nine. <laughs> that's hysterical. So all right, so um. You worked on Pretty Woman, which 
um, you know, it's a classic now. And, and when it came out, I mean, people, again, who weren't around during that time, it was a phenomenon. I mean, Julia, it made Julia Roberts who she was, who she is. It, you know, Richard Gere was Richard Gere already, but it just completely exploded him into another stratosphere after that. Um, I heard the stories because we, we had a, a friend in common, someone we knew that book, you know, he was my instructor, Walter, who was my instructor and, uh, and the co, uh, the associate producer on, um, yeah. and I think he did, he didn't do second unit on that one, but, uh, associate producer, uh, and I think he worked with Gary. He, he came over with Gary from Happy Days, if I remember. Yeah. And when yeah. I say Gary, I say Gary Marshall, the, the late great um, director. Now, I, I'd love to hear the story from your point of view. Now, I, I heard about 3000 3000 bucks or $3,000, which was the original title. Um, and the original ending for Pretty Woman, not so uplifting. Uh, <laughs> boy, let's just say boy does not get girl and then some. And then there was a bit darker, bit darker ending. Um, but Gary came in and kind of, Gary marshalized it, essentially, just made it a little bit more. So tell me, from your point of view and from the screenwriter's point of view, how was that process? Um, well, I mean, it was fascinating. And um, what, what, what had happened was I had optioned that project. You know, it got people back then paid, and probably still do, pay a lot of attention to the projects that get selected for Sundance. Because I wasn't a big, you know, I, I was not well known. My client was not well known. But when people saw that our project was picked for Sundance, the phone started ringing. Long story short, I optioned it to Vestron. And uh, it wasn't all that terribly long before Vestron uh, let us know they were going into bankruptcy. Right. So we got it in, turn got it in turnaround to uh, transitioned over to Arnon Melshon's relatively new company back then, which was New Regency. And so I optioned it to New Regency and, you know, a similar experience, like nothing terrible, but we weren't getting it financed and we weren't getting it cast. Uh, Richard Gere had passed on it, uh, we went to him while it was at Vestra and went to him again at New Regency and he'd passed on it both times, uh, despite Ed Lomato, his agent, banging his shoe on the table saying, you got to do this, you got to do this. Anyway, so um, I had sent that script kind of out of frustration. We were in the doldrums. I sent it as a writing sample to uh, a senior VP over at Touchstone, the sister, Disney sister label. And um, it was supposed to be, here's a setup, you know, we're going to come in in a week and we'll pitch you two Disney appropriate stories. This one's not for Disney. It's about a working girl. And the phone rang a few days later and they basically said, uh, we want to buy it. And I was like, did you read the right script? Um, anyway, long story short, it turns out that um, uh, they were going into production with, <clears throat> with Gary Marshall as the director uh, and the full complement of production personnel, Diane, you know, Diane Crittenden casting, et cetera, et cetera, on What About Bob? Um, but Michael Keaton, who was originally going to be play the lead, his deal blew up for whatever reason. I don't know. And they had this sort of gap. Uh, and they looked at our film and said, you know, we could slot this in and, and have get, put Gary on that film, uh, et cetera. So we went in for a meeting and, you know, it's very unusual. You usually meet with an executive, maybe two. There were like over 20 people in the room and it was Gary and his team and it was all new Regency. And it was, you know, Ka I mean, Katzenberg in the room, and David Hoverman, the president of the studio. I mean, it was like a who's who. And um, <clears throat> long story short, after the meeting settled down and 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 uh david uh the president of the studio was speaking he he turned to he turned to me and said so on the disney lightning scale this is a four and we would like it to be a seven can you do that and, well you know even if you've never heard of the disney lightning scale you sort of get what the question is and so i just i i sort of looked pensive noticed everybody in the room staring at me and i just smiled and i said yeah we know exactly how to do that um, and you know, and it, <laughs> it was, and you had no and, idea, and then there's no idea how you're going to do that. <laughs> and that it didn't matter. We'd figure it out. Right? Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, if you look, I mean, if you look at it, if you go back and look at it, I mean, it's a Disney movie. Touchstone obviously was the adult version of, you know, the adult version with Down and Out in Beverly Hills, which was the launch of it, and, and it was what kind of brought Disney back out of it was almost bankrupt at a certain point when Eisner and, and Katzenberg showed up, but. 
even for Touchstone, you're making a movie about a working girl, about a prostitute. And how that movie is looked upon now is this just wonderful rom-com, like the epitome of a rom-com almost, is on paper absurd. But if you've seen the movie, you understand. <laughs> yeah. Well, what's absurd is that they could see in that original even the remote possibility because the original, let's just say it was edgy. It was not, you know, there was nothing warm and fuzzy or comedic about it. Um, it, it had some tones to it that were very dark or dark, not dark, but, you know, edgier than certainly the rom-com version. Um, but, but, you know, God bless, they figured it out and, and, and then put it to us to figure out how to transition it. Uh, and the only thing I really uh, said to the writer, Jonathan, was, look, I'm, we're going to make this deal. And my the the only condition that's a, that's a, a, you know live or die is that you have to be guaranteed the first rewrite to break the back of it as a comedy, um, and then they can hire. I know they're going to fire you immediately after the first draft, and that's okay. Expect that, and that's what happened. They hired three other writers. Um, uh, ironically, the first writer they hired made it even darker, yeah. uh, which was weird. Uh, but then they brought in Bob Garland, who's wonderful, the guy who wrote The Electric Horseman, um, and he just polished all the business dialogue. But then they brought in Barbara Den Benedict to do the final rewrite. And she basically one day whispered in my ear and, and said, because I, I, I was nervous. It's like, Barbara, which, you know, what, what's the direction here? Where are we going? And uh, she said, you know, frankly, Jonathan's draft was what the film should be on. My job is to take it as, as close to that as I can, making this studio believe that we've followed all their notes. And that's kind of what happened. Um, so we ended up with, with a, a script where Jonathan got sole credit, sole, uh, um, yeah, sole credit, because it really was his rewrite. Now, that's not to say it was the film. It wasn't. There was, um, you know, God bless Gary Marshall. I mean, uh, we'll go back. I'll tell you the story about how we got Julia and how we got our cast. But the fact that we inherited Gary Marshall was such a stroke of galactic good fortune. Like to get, I, and I honestly, I never would have thought of him as a director of this film, certainly not the way it was originally constructed. But the fact that we got Gary Marshall was truly miraculous. Uh, so I give Gary enormous credit. It was Gary Marshallized. He is, you know, we, we sort of had a rule of thumb in production, which was, you know, shoot. You know, what, one, one take is scripted and then let's play, let's improv, because that's what he does. And he has such, he had and, and is the king of uh, finding that, that common heartbeat. He knows just where to find the magic. And he gives enormous freedom, not to uh, just the actors, which he did, but to the whole set. We had an open set. It was full on participation. You know, if craft services had an idea, we want to hear about it. Um, so I give enormous credit to Gary. I give enormous credit to starting with the writer, Jonathan, but enormous credit to Gary Marshall, without whom this film wouldn't be what it is. And also to the actors. I mean, there were stunning moments where, like the, there's a scene where she's on the balcony in the penthouse of the hotel, and she talks about, I won't settle, I want the full, I, I, I won't compromise, I want the whole dream. Mm -hmm. And that was not written that way. That was just Julia just doing a high wire act, going with her character where she needed to go. It was stunning. And, and then there were other, you know, like that was just the ethos of, of, of that set was like, let's, let's all just give our best. And um, actually, Gary Marshall, um, you know, there were a bunch of, of what we call fog, friends of Gary. Uh, and some of them were, uh, you know, in, in, the, in different scenes, some of them were in the crew and, and then some were just visitors to the set, like Marty Kersfeld, who I think he'd worked, uh, with Gary, uh, Marty had worked with Gary on Overboard and one of, one of his other films, he was a creative consultant and he was on the set one day, that scene where he's got her, uh, he's taking, Edward's taking Vivian to her first ever opera at the War Memorial in San Francisco. And she's in a red Cinderella dress and they're in the elevator. Whatever line was in the script, I don't remember, to be honest, but we were looking at it, it wasn't really working. So we're staring, 
huddled around Video Village looking at our leads inherent, you know, full wardrobe. And suddenly this voice, which is Marty Kersfeld, whispers, what if she were to say, in case I forget to tell you later, I had a wonderful time tonight. Oh, I know. And you, you could have heard a pin drop. I mean, I just, I was speechless, looked at this guy thinking, God spoke. Uh, <laughs> Exactly. You know, never have I heard and in the essence of a, of a character summed up in one line so beautifully. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, of course, it worked and it stayed in the movie and, and uh, whatnot. But, um, yeah, I mean, I think there were a lot of contributions. We can't we can't discount the talent. We certainly have to give, uh, you know, enormous, enormous credit to this film for one to one person. And that's Gary Marshall. Yeah. And how did you get Julia? How was because Julia had just done. Mystic Pizza, if I remember correctly, and she she was she was not a lead by any stretch. Uh, yeah. No, no. But the fellows who produced Mystic Pizza were friends at the time. I haven't seen them in a hundred years. But Mark and Scott, uh, before they locked picture, they, as a, as we often did, you, you have a, a friends and family screening, and you you know please kick the tires before we lock picture. What's give me your criticism? And so I showed up for uh, that screening, and when the lights came up. I basically said, I, you know, there were, and I, there were a good number of people there, but I basically said, I've absolutely no criticism. I think you've got a gem of a film, amazing cast, well-written, well-produced. Don't mess with it. It's good to go. Um, but by the same token, I don't know who that girl is, but that one, I, I need to know her. What's her name? And this is Julia Roberts and blah, blah, blah. And I said, would you introduce me? And they said, absolutely. Well, Julia... Uh, and her, her then, I believe it was her manager, Elaine Goldsmith, I forget. Uh, they read it and immediately, like within a few days, they, they, Julia was attached. And she stayed attached for the three years before I got it rocking at uh, Disney. But, um, uh, you know, at the time, when, when once we got it set up at Disney, uh, Disney really wasn't interested in Julia Roberts. They didn't know her. She was, in fairness, she was not yet known to the American public or to the studio system. And despite the fact that she had completed production on a yet to be released Steel Magnolias, right. so she was she was already well on her way. I mean, her her career arc was inevitable in my view. She was meant to be a star. Um, I think Pretty One was just a a, a really extraordinary fit for her. Um, but I knew that um, the studio was screen testing and auditioning and meeting with every name in the book, uh, both male and female, uh, for the leads. And so I didn't really have a chance uh, to put my argument forward for Julia until we had a male lead. And I just, you know, basically let them know that, you know, really we wanted Richard and he had turned us down twice, but we never had a major studio, a major director, and a major checkbook, and maybe we should have a run at that. Mm-hmm. And they did, and they made him the, you know, the Godfather offer, and he didn't refuse. And um, it, actually, it was a tentative yes. It's a sweet story. A tentative yes. Uh, Ed Lamana was was you know a real champion, and so at that point, I went to Gary Marshall. And, and basically said, look, there's this, you know, I know we're meeting a lot of talent, a lot of females for the lead, but there's this one young actress I'd love you to meet. But I'd like to put a, a you know, a condition on it, which is to say, I want you to meet her alone. I don't need to be, no one else should be there. And I said, and by the way, there's a warning that goes with it, which is you're going to fall in love. Just be aware. So, you know, that was kind of sealed the deal. Anyway, he met with her and he absolutely said, yes, you know, this is like, she's amazing. Um, and so we, we did a, um, he flew her to New York to meet with Richard. He was going to try and put, put the bow in, you know, tie a bow in this. So he took her to Richard's apartment in New York and they walked in and they were introduced, Richard and Julia. And apparently, as the story is told, Gary, uh, after a couple of minutes, excused himself, said, yeah, I'm going to go to the bathroom or I'm going to make a call or whatever he was going to do. And he walked away to another part of the apartment. And 15 minutes later, he called Richard's cell 
and from the back of the apartment and said, how's it going? And R Richard was talking to him and, and Julia uh, saw some post-its on Richard's desk, grabbed a pen and wrote something on it and tore it off and handed it to Richard. And all it said on it was, please say yes. Oh. And, right? Oh. And of course, right there in the moment, he smiled and over the phone to Gary, he said, yes. Oh. And that, I mean, it, it it doesn't get any better than that. I mean, and 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 just that story alone, it, it kind of permeates the entire movie. That heart, that thing, is there. Um, it's it's undeniable. I must have seen Pretty Woman a million times during over over the last thirty years. It's just something that you, just one of those films that you do. And and Julia, I mean, she was also nominated for that, if I'm not mistaken, right? She was. She was. She got a nomination, and uh, as she did for Steel Magnolias. Right. I mean, yeah, I mean, she came out of the gate being pretty all, hot. All, you know, all Julia all the time. But yeah, so it was it was a blessing. They did, you know, we did a screen test just to sort of finalize it. Mm -hmm. And uh, all I can tell you is, you know, even before they started rolling camera, uh, it was it was the, the the needle just blew right off the far right of the chart. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. Uh, yeah, and it's yeah. I just I just still remember going to see it and my mind being blown. And of course, that also at the video store was a big rental. Uh, <laughs> we had more than one copy, if I remember correctly. Um, yeah. Now you you um, you had a nice little run there for a minute because a few a, a couple movies later you also worked on Under Siege, which uh, which was a massive hit and pretty much, if I'm not mistaken, still the biggest hit of Steven Seagal's career. If I'm not mistaken. I might be, but I yeah. think it was his biggest. I, 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 I'm not absolutely sure, Alex. I know it was huge. It, it's, it's you know, it's, it spawned a sequel. Warner, you know, it was it was a big deal for Warner Brothers. It was uh, actually the first time they released a film of that type in, in in October, and it set all kinds of records. So I don't really know. I I think it's certainly one of his biggest, if not his biggest box office uh, experience yeah and, and i know tommy I and mean, tommy lee jones was just amazing in that book and gary Busey, amazing in that so i mean there was there was so <laughs> much he had so much support around him i mean a lot of support around him um and the, i forgot who the director was um but he was also a, andy andy davis yeah andy davis uh, the fugitive yeah yeah i mean he's not yeah. a slouch no, and, and Andy was amazing. He had worked with Stephen once before, and I also loved his. Uh, and Andy always worked with Peter McGregor Scott, who's no longer with us. What an amazing gentleman! So good at what he did. He was sort of a the the hands on line producer. Uh, you know, he was. Uh, anyway, they were a delight to work with. In fact, I don't know if you remember, there was a party scene in 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 the battleship um, for the admiral's birthday, and there was a, a jazz. A jazz band that played? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the jazz band was led by Andy Davis's brother. They're good Chicago boys. <laughs> oh, nepotism at its best. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. Hey, I, I, I do the same thing. Um, but I remember that movie really well as well. And that was also a, f a fairly big hit for you. For you. I mean, w when you were, I mean, obviously when Pretty Woman and then Under Siege, you know, a couple of, a few years later came out, the town looks at you very differently after a massive hit um, and the door is all open. Can you talk a little bit about being in that kind of, I always like to call it the center of the hurricane because I mean, as a producer, people start picking up your, Oh, you, you, oh, you, you were also an executive producer on, on pretty woman. Okay. I'll, they pick up the calls. How is that? What is it like being in, in that space in Hollywood, especially during that time, which was a pretty insane time. It was a pretty insane time. Um, <clears throat> it was actually a brilliant time, um, mm -hmm. not just because of the studio. The studio system was so different, and it mm -hmm. was run by years before the studios were bought by these larger companies. Uh, but because there were, I, I don't know the number, but you know, it seemed like there were almost three dozen. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe there were two dozen really robust indie companies, the Hemdales and Vestrons, and so on and so forth. And they were making amazing, you know, they were making a Platoon and Salvador and Dirty Dancing and all these, you know, just their output was equal to the studios. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so it was a really good time to be uh, in front of or behind the camera. Uh, you know, whatever you did, it was a good time. And um, and I think that, you know, I sort of I sort of I didn't grow up in the business. I was still relatively young in the business to have a film like Pretty Woman be your first studio film and perform. I mean, when we were making it, the truth is we had a reputation of, oh, that little film in trouble because the we were extraordinarily low budget for a studio film by studio standards. And uh, we were everyone knew we were doing a lot of improv and that we were trying to turn it from a, you know, because it had been so widely read and well regarded as the original that people knew how big the transition uh, might be. And so we, 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 we had a sort of a, you know, oh, it's a little film. Oh, they're trying to find their, their tone uh, and so on and so forth. So when it came out and did the kind of business that it did, and it was in the theaters actively for six months, uh, and it was doing, it was, you know, doing five figures, uh, every, every, every week. And in fact, it went up the second week. So we knew word of mouth was good. We sort of knew from the test screenings that we've, that we might have not a hit, but a successful film, right. By, by minimum definitional standards, we had no idea that it was going to be a touch of chord the way it did. In fact, my my concern, and I don't think I was alone in it, was that we're going to get pilloried. I mean, it was the era of Gloria Steinem and, you know, whatnot. And I thought putting this out as a role model, I don't know. Yeah. Um, but I think we have to be prepared that there's going to be some upset people. Uh, and ironically, that never uh, that never came to be. In fact, the very people I was concerned about embraced it and came out very publicly uh, in support of it. So it was interesting, but um, I think I was to answer your question, Alex. I think I was a pretty naive guy at the time. I mean, I I was grateful. I was excited to be welcomed into the game. I don't think I was like sitting outside of myself, looking at the situation, going, "Oh my gosh, guess guess what just happened." Mm-hmm. That wasn't my thought process. I was grateful to be. Uh, able to reach out to people and talk about other projects and, you know, and, 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 and just happy to have a film out in the world that was doing well. Um, I think I, I started to figure it out a little bit more with Under Siege because, you know, now it wasn't a one trick pony. It was, you know, here was another really solid, solidly performing film with name talent and a big studio and all of that and uh, spawned a sequel uh, et cetera. So, you know, it, 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 that was when I sort of realized, oh gosh, you know, I, there's, I always thought that no one's unreachable. You just have to know their assistant and then you sneak in. But <laughs> yeah, true. really. Very, very, that, true. It's that, very that, true. Yeah. Uh, if you want to own the town, just own the assistants and you're all, you're all good. Uh, but I think at that point I, I, I started to realize, oh, you really have established sort of a beachhead and you can have access when you need it, whether it's agencies or studios or production company, whatever it might be. Um, and, you know, I mean, I think, the, you know, a good example of that. Um, look, one of one of my one of my favorite films that, that I've been involved with anyway, uh, was uh, a film, uh, the film, The Mothman Pro- Prophecies. Yeah, we and, do, of course. And. The reason, sort of the non-public reason why I say that is because the writer who brought that to me uh, was one of the co-writers. He was a he, he had a writing partner prior, and that team was. Uh, <laughs> it's interesting. Their attorney, their attorney called me and said, "I have the, this team of writers, and they had this script called um, uh, In Dark Territory, uh, and." Um, their agent shopped it everywhere and everybody passed on it, but would you read it? And it was like, that's always a dubious honor, right? So, okay, fine. Send it over. I'll read it. Long story short, I said, I, no, I, I like it. I think I know. I think I know if we can change the title and make these couple of changes, send the writers in, let's talk. And they did. And I sold it to Warner Brothers who had passed on it 90 days earlier. And it became ultimately the sequel to Under Siege. Um, but one of those writers then later, some years later, came to me with this project, The Mothman Prophecies. And honestly, Alex, when I read it, I was it sucker punched me in the third eye because 
not in an absolutely literal sense, but when my best friend, my dad, died unexpectedly, uh, the next year and a half, two years were uh, that 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 film sums up my experience. It was like that almost losing your tether um, and assuming everything, all these weird things are happening because it's your dad trying to reach back out to you or your loved one trying to reach back out to you. And it was a very, very odd time where you're sort of walking in two worlds. And when I read the script, I thought, oh, my God, I, I don't care. Same thing. It had been shot by the Asian. Everybody had passed, and I didn't care. I said, look, if I can find one company that didn't pass on it, and I did. There was one company, Lakeshore, great company. And I said, I don't, I don't care. This is going to be a private homage to my dad. I am going to get this film made. And uh, the team over at Lakeshore read it, and they, they said it was you know, fascinating and amazing and wonderful. And thank you. It's going to be a pass. <laughs> uh, Hollywood, Hollywood. And, yeah, very Hollywood. And, and there was a long pause. And I basically uh, said, listen, I really appreciate it, guys. I love what you said about the script, but I'm going to have to pass on your pass. And so, I, you know, I, look, of course you can pass, but I just, will you give me a face to face before you make it official? And they said, yeah. Um, and I think there are two things that were at play. One is I went in and, and never talked about the script. It was a very short meeting. I basically went in and did 15 minutes on who my dad was, our relationship, and what, what you know, like the, the, the crack in the universe that I fell into in my experience following uh, his death and how we're all hardwired to understand the loss and despair that follows. And anyway, long story short, they turned their, you know, they, they, they huddled and they, they changed their mind and they came back and said, yeah, you're, I think we think you're right. We're, we're going to go with this. And so I was able to get that film made and it, I, I thought um, it, it turned out really well. I think it lived up to its promise. Um, and um, I'm blanking at the moment. Why am I blanking? Uh, Mark telling okay. Mark Pellington directed it. That's right. Well, I'll tell you one thing. I saw that movie once, and I will never watch it again because it terrified me. I was terrified after I saw that movie, and I just like it, it to my bones. It's like very rare for a movie to like hit me to the bones. I will not watch that movie again. Like I don't even like saying the name. Uh, it just freaks me out. It, it was it was done very very well. Yeah. So I was very proud of that for a for a, a you know as a producer, but uh, also as a son. And, um, and I, you know, I, I think I, I can't tell you for a fact, but I will tell you my suspicion is that having had a couple of successes prior to, uh, that ask, uh, it didn't hurt the cause. No, it didn't. And it did well from, I remember it did, it did very well and it did, it did the box office. Um, no, I mean, it's been, it, it's, it's remarkable the projects you've been involved with. Um, and I have to ask you something, though, just because, so, you know, you told your story of how you you naively got into the business and how you were like, well, you know, I'll just do this and I'll do that. And I get in and you were coming from, a, you know, you weren't coming like sleeping on couches. You know, you were an attorney, but you knew you didn't want to make be an attorney. Where do you see people go wrong when they try to break into this business? And I always like the term break in like it's varsity. Like you, you got you know, you to break in, you got to. Yeah, dude, like it's not like how can I, you know, be part of a community? No, how can I break in? It's I mean, it's just always that. But where do you see people going wrong? Because I'm assuming you've been approached a million times about, hey, can you do this for me? Hey, can you get this for me? Where do you see where do you see people go wrong? Um, well, I think you just put your finger on, you know, you you really just pointed right to it, which is people have this very unwelcoming story, almost a, a sort of a monster story about how unfriendly and how closed off is this thing called Hollywood, which is not my experience of it. I mean, it, you know, I'm not going to, it's, it's not, it's not a panacea. It's not a utopia, but it's far from uh, what I think many people attribute to it in their mind. And um, I think part of the, uh, and they, I also think a lot of people don't realize the value they bring to the conversation. They feel needy. They feel insecure. They lack confidence. I'm going to come back to this. I just want to share one quick story. So, so years and years ago, 
there was a gal who had been a senior uh, VP, uh, head of, fundamentally the head of business and legal affairs for uh, a major, one of the six majors. Uh, and she'd done it for 14 years. She was a force of nature. Everybody in town knew her. She was a get it done gal uh, and really lovely. And one day she called me out of the blue and basically said, Gary, I, I, want, I, wanna, uh, I want you to coach me. And I was like, what? Uh, you're one of the most formidable people in the industry. Uh, I probably would love to learn what you've forgotten. <laughs> what, 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 what could I possibly help you with? And what she revealed was that she had been sort of a closet screenwriter at night and on the weekend uh, over the recent years. And she wanted to leave her executive suite position and become a full-time screenwriter. She had just officially done that. She had left the studio uh, and was now a full-time screenwriter. Wow. What happens apparently, Alex, when that choice gets made is they also give you a free lobotomy. You, you forget absolutely everything that you know, all of the fears well up, all of the insecurities well up, all of the, if I'm ever going to be good enough, uh, it's too hard, I don't know how, it's too competitive, and you all these stories rocking in your head, and it really starts to take effect. Um, and I, I, I think that, it, you know, the biggest, mis I mean, there are a lot of mistakes that people often can or do make. But I think one of them is just not wearing their humanity up front. So you see, you know, the biggest tool of a writer is the blind query letter, the worst idea ever taught to anybody on the planet. The most impersonal, like easiest to ignore, flying into the same inboxes. And by the way, they're all going to what? Agents and producers. Will you produce me? Will you represent me? No one's reaching out to mentors saying a cinematographer, an editor, a casting director, you know, like... People who are in the center of the ring, no one's knocking on their door. What, could, what, what kind of relationship and what kind of community could you build and what kind of lessons could you learn? People are very narrow focus, uh, very nearsighted about things, and uh, they sort of mimic other people's behaviors. It's, a, it's, it's really not a very, you know, if, if you were in any other industry, and you said, I'm going to focus 100% of my craft and I'm going to really ignore my marketing or my entrepreneurial or career you know, side, uh, you'd be out of business. And you end up losing a lot of brilliant stories and a lot of brilliant storytellers because they just get worn down. But I think it's one of the biggest mistakes. I, there's, a, there's a long laundry list of mistakes and I've made many of them myself, tons. But I think the one that really is most crucial is they get shut down and they don't share who they, the artist, the storyteller, the creator are. They don't share their humanity or their origin story or why they're so deeply passionate and connected to this particular story. They hide behind the script cover, behind the project, mm -hmm. behind a blind query letter. And, 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 and they don't give people a chance to get yeah. to know, let alone champion them. So, you know, I, I, go ahead. I don't interrupt you, but it, it, it seems that's such an interesting way of looking at it because, you know, I did it when I was coming up. You know, you would just try to, you would just try to, try to connect with, uh, you know, a, a producer, a, a, a director, an agent, a manager, an actor, whatever, at such a superficial level, and that's what this whole town is built on: is a lot of these superficial relationships. But whenever you do connect authentically with someone. I found in my career that you hold on to these people, that they, yes. you, you, because it's so rare to find authenticity in Hollywood. I mean, even if it's negative authenticity, I'm like, for someone to say, your script sucks, I'm sorry, at least it's something authentic, as opposed to, it was great, it's fantastic, it's yeah. amazing, it should win an Oscar, we're going to pass, which is the, the nicest FUs. Hollywood is the art. I, 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 yeah, give us the truth, right? In fact, I, I've, I've often coached people and said, look, the, you know, rejection is your best friend. Yeah. Because 99.9999% of all humans, when rejected, will react predictably. You will not. You're going to be the one who takes a nice deep breath 
And when you hear that, you're going to smile and you're going to say, thank you. And you're going to say, but what would be really the most helpful, valuable thing in life right now for me is if you do me the honor of sharing the truth, why, why is this a pass for you? I want to learn. And what happens is you're probably going to learn something. But more importantly, you've just honored them and you've bonded with them in a way that very, very few people ever will. You've taken advantage of a moment. It's kind of like the, um, uh, it always kills me. I had a, a actor friend, uh, this goes back a ways, but anyway, I ran into him one day and he was in a, he was, he was really in a bad mood. He was in a funk. And I said, what's going on? And he said, I just came from this audition. It's a role I really wanted. And I didn't get the gig. And I said, yeah. And so that's why you're all upset. He said, yeah. I said, well, tell me about it. What was the project and who was in the room? And he, he told me about the project. And he said, yeah. And it was the casting director and the casting associate. And it was the, the producer. And I forget if the director was there. It was probably just the producer and whatever. And I said, really? All of those people were in the room. And uh, do you feel you gave a great, you know, a, a, good, a good solid performance? He said, yeah. But I didn't get the gig. And I said, well... I, I, I mean, I, I don't want to be unsympathetic, but here's the deal. You know, I think you think the purpose of an audition is to get a job, and I don't. Let's talk about that. Because you're going to live in a world of pass-fail, ARF, no, no gray. And I live in a world where I think, wow, every audition should be celebrated, and not, it's not about the result. It's an opportunity. You're being invited to a party that you want to be invited back to. So you go into a room and you hug and greet and smile at everybody, starting with the assistant and then the casting people and then the producer and then the director and every, and you do it on the way back out. And you, of course, you're going to give your best performance. Uh, that's just a given. But what you really want is to make them feel they've gotten a sense of who you really are as a personality, as a human, not just as a, an actor giving a performance and that they like you. And gosh, you know, he may not be right. There's a million reasons why you might not be right for a role in a moment. But they've got a lot of projects and these people are serious people and you want to know them. And you, you know, you, you just want them to like you enough to think of you in the future. And if you've done that, you just won. That's, that's the long game. Isn't it amazing that, and please tell me what you think, the, if you are likable, if you are someone that people can work with and stay in a room with for 10 hours or on set with for 10 or 12 hours, or when it's like hour 15 OT and you still got a good attitude, if you're that person, wouldn't you go out of your way to figure out how I can get that? And that might not be right now for this project, but I'm going to remember that guy or that gal, and I'm going to find a way to bring them into what we're doing because we need people like that because they might not even be the most talented. They might not even be, but that power of being likable. It's like uh, the best advice I ever said, I ever heard, is like uh, for being in film business, like just don't be a dick. And <laughs> and it's the greatest, it's the greatest advice ever. It's good advice. <laughs> it's it's good, good advice. Just don't be a dick. And yeah. not be, and not being that dick will get you more work and more opportunities than. But can, is that your experience as well? Like if you see someone who's just man, it's likable. I think I could really work with this person. I got to figure out a way how to make this happen. I, I think that's only 100% true 365 days a year. <laughs> if, if you're, if you're, I don't care if you're looking for a production job or an acting job or a, a, an agent or a manager. You know, it's like they, the, the me, they're going to take the measure of you whether they're conscious or, or whether they articulate it or not. They're going to take the measure and say, am I going to be able to go the long distance with this person? Am I going to enjoy this process? Are they going to contribute or are they going to be nagging at me and complaining? Um, I had a showrunner that was an exec producer of a TV series that I was, uh, we were talking about. I was, I'm always fascinated by the writer's room, right? It's mm -hmm. like staff. Uh, I just find that dynamic so interesting. And, and you know, it, it, uh, anyway, <clears throat> so I was, I was asking him, I said, you know, what, what are you looking for? How do you build that team? What are the things that are going through your head? He said, look, it's really simple. It's 3 a.m. We have until daylight to crack this thing that all of us have been unable, un, unable to crack. We're all sleep deprived. We're exhausted. We're unhappy. We want to go home. We want to sleep in our bed. We miss our family and we're hungry. Who do I want next to me? 
that's the pic, that's the image in my head. Who's the person? And it's not about the most talented person. He used those words just like you did. He said, I will absolutely gladly take the second or third most talented person if they're the one I want sitting next to me. Because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. I know I know a lot of very talented people who are absolute dicks. Uh, <laughs> and I wouldn't want to work with them. I, I just like, and I would take second or third tier who's going to give it their all. Yes. And we're, and we're going to get to the finish line because we're going to enjoy it. And and again, as I've gotten older, I've just realized that life is way too short <laughs> to, to, to just work with people who are dicks. It's just it's just like I don't want to work with people like that. I want to work. I want to find good people who I enjoy this process with because it should be an enjoyable process. We are some of the most lucky human beings on the planet to do what we get to do on the day. It is luxury. Oh my God. God, can you imagine? Yeah be miserable or to be complaining doing what we do is like not acceptable it's no no i mean look <laughs> look and there's like you know you could be on the set of the revenant and uh and that's a, that's a tough shoot uh you could be on the set of titanic that's a tough shoot uh but even on the worst day you're still being paid yeah. to play you, to, to enjoy to be an artist and and that's such a rarity in this world and I think I think filmmakers, I, I, you know, I think filmmakers and screenwriters they lose fo- they lose focus on that because they just, you know, especially when you're young, you're all you want the. I, I joke about this all the time, but, but and I'm sure you've run into these, you know, with your with your work, uh, where you went, you look at the filmmakers and screenwriters who come in with this entitlement. They're like, why hasn't Hollywood, uh, you know, uh, you, you know, recognized my genius? I mean, I don't understand. Like, I'm such a good writer. Why haven't I sold 15 scripts already? And I should be living in the Hollywood Hills. Why have I not gotten that part yet? I'm obviously the best for it. It's like this this entitlement that comes into it, and and it's. I mean, I was like when I was in my early twenties, I was just like, I'm obviously, come on, when is someone going to recognize how amazing I am? And then the business goes, <laughs> and they laugh. Do you have you run into that kind of scenario? <laughs> I've no, I, I have no idea what you're talking about, Alex. I've never, I've never met an entitled creative in my lifetime. Uh, I'm sure it'll happen, but no. Not yet. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I think if 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 you could just give people a timeout and say, can we just set that on the sideboard for the moment? Uh, I want you to spend the next 24 hours, better yet, the next 72 hours with only one idea in mind. I want you to be 100% other focused. How can you contribute to them in that moment? Just flex the muscle. Oh my God. I, I, I tell people all the time that if you want to create authentic relationships with someone, offer, you offer to be of service. Don't ask when you first meet somebody, hey, I know that you know Gary Marshall. Can you send him my script? Like, yeah. obviously, you could pick up the phone and talk to Gary or to talk to Richard or talk to Julia or wh- whoever, the, you know, whatever connections you have. I just met you. By the way, I need you to do me a favor. What do you talk? I mean, that happens all the time to me. I'm nobody. <laughs> I'm nobody in my world. And I get hit like that on a daily basis by people. And I always tell people, if you want to build relationships, you need to be of service. I've built relationships over courses of three or four years before I ever asked for a thing. Because I truly built a real relationship, an authentic relationship. And I was always there to help them. And then if I need some help as a friend, you go, hey, can you connect me with this or can you do that? And But that's an authentic relationship as opposed to five minutes after we meet. Can you can you invest in my movie, Gary? I need, I need can you connect me to half a million? <laughs> like, that- I mean, it's, it, it's almost <clears throat> what's surreal is how constant that mindset in other words these habits that people have reaching out to people they've never met in person probably (laughs) never had a single uh real what i would call conversation but they'll reach out to them and send their script or their reel or whatever and say will you produce will you work for me for free to produce this movie it'll take you several years on your dime uh you know, it, and, and it's brilliant. So I'm doing you a favor or <laughs> conversely, you know, will you, you know, Mr. Agent, Mr. or Miss, Miss Manager, will you represent me 
Same deal. You can't think of a bigger ask. You're asking people who've made this massive commitment in life to what they what they do. <clears throat> and you're saying, out of all the possible people you could collaborate with or projects, choose me. Now, I haven't bothered to introduce myself. Right. I haven't bothered to get to know what, what you care about or what makes you tick. Haven't even done that really with your assistant because I'm afraid of calling strangers. But please, you know, and 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 it's it's not always because they it's it's not even that they necessarily come across as entitled or uh, think thinking they're so grand. It's just a common behavior set. Yeah, it's I mean, it's, it's like if you were in any other industry. Hmm. Period. Full stop. If you were in any other industry. Right. I'm like, I always, I always tell people, if you were in the cookie industry, you wouldn't walk up to the CEO of a cookie company and go, hey, I've got this great cookie recipe. I think it's going to make you millions. <laughs> but, like, that just doesn't happen. You know, it's, it's, it, we are such a, a group of, I always call us carnies. You know, we're carnival folk. You know, we're just a unique group of artists that travel and we set up tents and we put on a show and we record the show and then we go, like, we're carnival folk. And it, it's just such a, a remarkable, <laughs> it's just such a remarkable industry. Um, I love the, I love it. I've always loved it. I can't quit it as much as I've tried. There's many times in my career, the last 25 years that I've just like, I just, I gotta go do something else. This is too hard. This is too brutal. And then, like a like a disease, it flares up again because I got yeah. bitten by the bug at that damn video store, and then I can't I can't quit it. Like I can't quit it. Nothing I do, uh, I have to be around it. I have to do what I love doing. And it's it's it's. And I'm not sure if that's a that's not the way the cookie business is. Like you, do, I mean, I'm sure for some people it's in their blood the cookies, but generally speaking, <laughs> well, yeah, I mean it's. It, I, I think if you want to endure, and, and I, I do think that we're blessed to be in this business. I think it's a crazy business. <laughs> it, 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 it can be a shocking business. It can be an amusing business. It can be many things. It can be disappointing. But if you want to be in this business, if you're one of the crooked people and you love hanging out with crooked people, and I don't mean crooked isn't, you know, dishonest. I mean, like, we're, are we wear our humanity. We're, we're flawed. We're, you know, it's, it's fabulous, right? We're story. The people who are drawn to storytelling. Yeah. Uh, then you have to see it for what it is, which is it's. If you can, if you, if you number one, you got to be really determined, and you got to, you know, I mean, it's it can't be a hobby. It's got to be you got to commit, and if you're committing, it's about building relationships. And it's about getting better at your craft. But if you do one without the other, and to build relationships, you can't be asking huge favors of total strangers. It's just not how people are aware. It's not the way the world works. It's not the yeah. way the world works. I mean, and, and, and you, you've mentioned it a bunch. I've mentioned it a bunch, but we call this a business. But no other business in the world that I know of can drop half a million dollars on a product that could literally be worth it. You yeah. know? If you don't know what you're doing, you could, I mean, if you spend a half a million dollars on a house, there's codes, there's things that you have to pass through the inspection process. Even if you made an ugly house, it's still a house. Someone can live in it. But if you make an ugly movie, <laughs> and I've seen those movies, it's money just flushed down the toilet. It's a remarkable business that way. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's true. It's true. And if, you know, so you got to pay your dues. I mean, I think part of it is also, uh, I, I, I mean, when I started out, I was just so excited. I was wagging my tail. I was just so happy to be here. Uh, and if anyone would talk to me, like, okay, you made my week. Um, but I, I, you know, I, I think that it's we're living in a different time. Um, back then, there was also still a, some not the old studio system where. Actors were under contract and they had to make six films a year and they were paid very little. And, you know, but but that sort of like we're going to work you till you're brilliant at your craft. Right. And people had long apprentice uh, runways. Right. It's also when there was not a thing about make or break the first weekend, and, you know, with a huge marketing budget on a film. It's like it was a different time. 
And people really did develop relationships because they were working so much and for such a long time graduating without grand expectations of I'm going to be a producer my first, you know, my first script. Um, and I think that the, the, some of that is, you know, there's this perception that the business is contracted. And I think it's just the opposite. I think it's an expanding business. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I just look at the, the demand for fresh stories in every format, more formats than we're used to. It used to be just series and film. Now it's docu limited series and docu-series and, you know, you, whatever, you, whatever you're excited about, there's a place for it. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's more buyers than ever and, you know, more mouths to feed, so to speak. Yeah. So I, I think it's a really extraordinary time, but you got to kind of get old school. I think you got to, you know, be willing to actually meet the people that you want to endure and have enduring relationships with. I think you got to get, you know, get over yourself and, 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 you know, be a little bit more, I don't know, look over the hedgerow, get a little generous, be sure your personality, get, you know, pick up the phone, do something. You have to be vulnerable. You have to yeah. be vulnerable. You have to become a little bit vulnerable, just a bit, show people a little bit past the veneer that yeah. you put, because that's what people will connect to. That's what people connect to. Um, that's yeah. my experience, at least. And you know what's interesting? I've always said, it, it, you know, it, it, and I think it's true of a lot of industries. I think because it's about the human quotient, the human factor. I don't think it takes an enormous amount to shine, to stand out. Mm -hmm. If you show, as you were saying, Alex, if you show a little bit of vulnerability, if you're a little bit other focused, if you're a little bit generous, if you're just a little bit of those things, you'll you'll look like a rock star. Right, because you have no competition. Because <laughs> nobody else is doing it. You you automatically rise above um, yeah. above the noise by doing that. And I did that when I was coming up as a PA. You know, yeah. I was I was just being I was always trying to be of service to people and that's how I got my first gigs and got my first got jobs and all that. Yeah. And we talked about it before, but I think the other thing that the other the other oversight or mistake that people often make is you know, they, they, they're so focused on the name on the door and forget the name on the door. You know, like, by the way, if you're fortunate enough to, to, to develop some kind of connection with them, people who are successful, who've made it, know it's a team sport. They didn't get there on their own. Mm -hmm. And they tend to be very generous. They tend to be very available. They tend to be great mentors and friends, whatever. But you don't expect that the name on the door is going to necessarily be available to respond to you. People in this business matriculate quickly. They're they're vetted. They're you know like the assistants, the entry level, the creative execs, the, all those low lying positions. Um, well, I, I did I did this as a as a uh, sort of off the cuff lesson for a group the other day where I just went on LinkedIn and I typed in a keyword, and up came all these young looking faces, and I went one by one and I said I want let's just go through the resume. And they worked at these five amazing companies and they went to Harvard and they went here and they went there. And these are like the most vetted people. Uh, otherwise, they're not going to be sitting on the desk of a great agent or a great producer, or whatever it is. And they are ambitious and they're smart and they need to grow their own relationships to have currency. These people need to know you as much as you need to know them. Just get out of your own way. Get to know them because they grow. We grow together in micro generations. And just make friends with a lot of people who are already on the inside, but who are available. Right. And, you know, the, 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 that's, that's the, uh, it may seem like the long game, but it's really the, the, the diamond lane. Mm -hmm. I, I, I would agree with you a hundred percent. One thing that we, one thing that uh, this business is known for is rejection. Uh, you're going to get a thousand no's before you get one. Yes. And everyone gets no's. Even Steven Spielberg gets yeah. no's. You know, even Scorsese gets to know. It's like I, I, I tell people that all the time, and they go, "What?" I'm like, Spielberg couldn't get Lincoln made. Like he had to go. And Scorsese couldn't get some of his projects made. Like Oliver Stone is hustling for his next budget. Like it's, it, it, it everyone gets to know. How do you deal with rejection and continue to move forward and not get decimated by it, especially when you're at the beginning stages, when you don't have that armor and momentum to continue to move forward. Yeah, I listen. It's it. it I'm not going to say I'm immune to it. <clears throat> I I sort of flipped the script a little bit. Um, 
I always, first of all, I think that failure and success are the same exact goddamn thing. They're twins that were never really separated at birth. Yeah. You, you know, I mean, it, we've heard it a thousand times, the famous quote from Thomas Watson, who founded IBM. If you want to increase your rate of success, double your rate of failure. Um, yeah. or, uh, I think I'm doing it justice. Anyway, but that idea. Um, and I, I, I really don't, I see it as, 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 it's like on a spectrum. But wherever you are in that spectrum, including getting rejections, I always just reminded myself, what does that mean? That means I'm in the game. I'm making connections. I may be getting rejections, but I'm making connections. I'm being taken seriously enough to be in a conversation. So don't stop. Just keep pushing forward. I figured, you know, if I really suck, uh, then, you know, great. I'm going to, you know, if, if, if this, I'm not a big sports nut, but, you know, if it, I'd be batting less than 100, right? Okay. But if I'm batting 50 and I get, and I get enough at bats, am I creating insider relationships? Yeah, I am. I'm just failing a lot and I'm learning from that, but I'm, I, I just want to make sure I'm on the court, not in the stands. I want to make sure I'm in the game. Cool. And to me, rejection is um, an opportunity to learn. It's an, uh, it is legitimately, it's as if, if you're willing, if you're ballsy enough to follow through. It's a, so you learn, but it's also an opportunity as we talked about earlier to bond and really surprise people and, and take that, level of rapport and inch it forward. It's a game of inches, right? And, and move it forward. And there's really no downside to it. You know, you can't, it's like, I, I don't, I don't really take it personally. It's, um, it's the old Maya Angelou thing. If I, if I can let someone reject me and actually make them feel good leaving that conversation, I've now won a new friend. So whatever was said, they're not going to remember. I'm not going to remember. No one's going to remember. But they're going to know how I made them feel and vice versa. Great advice. That's great, great, great advice. Oh. I'm, going to ask you, I'm going to ask you a few questions to ask all my guests here. Um, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film industry or in life? Mm. Um, <clears throat> give yourself freedom. Give yourself permission. The shit that you worry about, and I think there's over 8 billion folks on the planet at this given moment, mm -hmm. not one of those 8 billion people are worried about the thing you're worried about. You know, get, get out of your own way. Uh, don't, you know, this is... Um, Stop being self-conscious. Stop thinking the world has you under a microscope, that they're grading you, that they're judging you. And if they are, fuck them. You don't want them in your life. I'm sorry. I just probably said something that's not supposed to happen on a podcast. It's all good. It's okay. It's raw. It's real. <laughs> okay. But it's true. It's yeah. absolutely true. If someone is that kind of a human, you don't want them in your life. So what do you care what they think? It's it's actually a good time to write them a little thank you note and say, you, you just saved me investing a whole bunch of time in the wrong direction. If you could just grow up fast enough on the inside to say, you know what, I'm going to be the, the truth of me. I'm going to be who I really am full on. And I'm not going to care because I'm going to win more friends than I'm going to make enemies. But at the end of the day, at the end of my life, will it have mattered that some people had judgment of me that I never even knew about? I don't mm -hmm. care. Um, I just, I, I really think that being proud of who you are, at least, and, and I don't mean in any sort of bragged, you know, not braggadocio, not, not, you can be humble and proud at the same time. Mm -hmm. You can be kind at the same time. But if people liked themselves and didn't give a wit about what other people thought, didn't give it so much weight and would share their story. I find that most people, the vast majority of people, um, if you ask them about themselves, they'll tell you a story. And that story is mostly uh, fiction because they've laden it with all kinds of stories that built up over the years and they've swept a lot of the good under the rug and they take themselves for granted. And it's, it's not that what you're going to, if I ask, if I ask, other people tell me about so-and-so that's nonfiction. I'm going to get the truth. They're going to tell me 
who they are, what the value of them is, you know, how they make them feel. They're going to tell me the stuff that matters. Um, and I think that people hold themselves back as a result and they don't share their story as a result. And if they could just learn to be proud of who they are, regardless, we all make mistakes. We've all got, you know, stories that, gosh, I'm embarrassed. Um, I better be the first to share that story about me before someone else does, whatever. But I just think, you know, like growing up, a lot of it is about becoming the best version of yourself, being okay with it, knowing every day you can make your, you know, be, you can strive to be better, not than your competition or someone else, but better than yourself, right? A better version of yourself. I don't know. I just, I, I think, I think that sort of, I'm, I'm not articulating it well, but that essential freedom to be who you are and do what you, what you care about, behave toward people in a way that makes you sleep well at night. If you do those things, I think that's what a successful life looks like. Not, and I love what you just said, not a successful career, but a successful life. And that's a very important distinction. So a lot of times filmmakers and screenwriters are so caught up into their, I'm only a screenwriter, I'm only a filmmaker, but at the end of the day, you're like, you know, you're also a human being. You're a father, you're a wife, you're a wife, you're a husband, you're a, a son or a daughter, you're other things besides the, your occupation. And that took me a long time. To, like when I was younger, I only identified myself as a filmmaker. And the moment that that didn't go well in my life, my life was over because I gave so much power to these people I was meeting that could give me, the, you know, like, why aren't you, why aren't you opening the door for me? Don't you understand that this is who I am without this, I am nothing. And it took me right. years to figure out that like, oh, I'm so much more than just a filmmaker. It's part of me, it's part of who I am, but it's so much, and that was a very, I just wanted to point that out because that's such an important lesson for people listening to understand is like you are not, you are not who, you're not what you do, you are who you are. And there's a very big difference in that. Do you agree? Oh, a thousand percent. You know, it's interesting, I, I had an amazing dad uh, he, he, he was nothing if not a people person and he had no filters at all. He wasn't well, a particularly, he did, well, he did, he did, he did well in life. We weren't rich, but he, you know, it, we weren't struggling. Uh, and, um, but from his perspective, he just, he couldn't, he literally didn't see someone's station in life. He didn't see what car they drove. He didn't see much of anything about them other than, uh, and when you spoke with him, you felt like you were the only person he was speaking to really, truly. He was like, you were special. Um, and, you know, I think we, we, you know, that's, that's some of that's a bit generational and some of it's just individual. And, um, but I think that I, I lost my thread. There was something I, you had said a minute ago that I wanted to get back to. Who It'll you come are. to me. If, if you're not who you are, but what, and not what you are, but. Uh, what you are, what you do, but who you are. Yeah, I mean, yes. I don't know. It's it's like trust yourself, share yourself with other people. You know exactly. I when I was when it, when when I was watching my dad, I guess the point I was trying to make is that you know there was a certain point that I recognized as I started to get out on my own, like when I went to college and beyond. Right? <laughs> that um, gosh, what what is, what's the best part of this experience of being out in the world on my own? And the best part of it was meeting other people, you know, and like creating this sort of world of, and I, and I, at some point I coined a phrase for myself, I coined a phrase, uh, which is that whatever I'm doing, whatever I'm busy doing, uh, really the underlying mission statement here is harvest genius. So if you, if, you know, like if I read a book by a great author, I wanted to track, I wanted to stalk that person. Uh, if I, you know, like if I went to a live event and someone was speaking and they were impressed, I, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to get in touch with them. I'm going to walk up to the stage. I'm going to get their number. I'm going to, whatever it takes. Like I didn't care about what walk of life they were in. I cared about whatever I thought was the best of humanity. Like I want good people in my life. So to this day, I've got tons of friends who have nothing whatsoever to do with film or television. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think that I'm a lot richer for it. 
Um, but it also keeps you a little bit balanced because Hollywood, there is that sort of almost vacuum that sucks you in a vortex, if you will, that sort of energy that says we are all consuming, we're inward facing. Like I think, you know, there, the, I won't tell who, but there was a story years ago about a big, big name producer who um, went on a holiday and he went alone. Had a family, but for some reason he was going alone. And he went somewhere, and wherever he went, when he checked in, they didn't know who he was. Uh, and uh, that vacation was supposed to be a, like a ten-day vacation. And he was home in two days, and and because he, he could not bear that he didn't get reflected back to him who he was. Wow! Wow! Right? Oh like God. how? How sad is that? Oh. Uh, I mean, this is a guy who could buy and sell companies who could, you know, he was like a big deal. But, you know, it's like, yeah, be, be, you know, like be on, plant yourself on terra firma. And the terra firma isn't, it's, it's not got the name Hollywood on it, right? It's, big, it's bigger and, than that. And like, you, and like you said, how sad it was for that producer. But there's a lot of sad, there's a lot of sad souls in this business. A lot of sad souls who... You know, I, my wife, like when we first got to L.A., my wife refused after like two or three of them. She's like, I can't go to any more parties with you uh, because all people want to talk about is the business. Like, I want to I want to have a human conversation. I'm like, oh, babe, we're in Hollywood. This is, this is what we do here. And I was so excited because I was coming from Florida. I was like, I, 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 yes, I want to talk about the business all the time because I never had a chance to do that before. And she's like, no, I really wanted to have a human conversation with another human being. But everybody you meet is just all about. What, who are you? What can you do for me? And you see it in the, you see it at these parties too sometimes. You're like, what do you do? Who are you? Okay. You can't do anything for me and I'll, I'll walk away. And they'll walk away from you. And you're like, wow. Like, you know, unless they, if, unless they see some sort of value, they don't even waste their time with you because they're hunting. They're like a, they're like a wolf pack <laughs> trying to find people to help them. It's just, it's a sad, it's a sad way of doing things, but, um, Toronto women. <laughs> Now, last question. Last question. Uh, three of your favorite films of all time. Oh my God, that's so unfair. People ask that question. It's so tough. Look, I grew up on the films of, of you know, the thing that made me fall in love and want to be down here were the films of the '70s, mm -hmm. right? Scorsese, uh, Co early Coppola. You know, I mean, on and on and on. I, I mean, the, it's it's like this kaleidoscope of of you know, Easy Rider and Five mm -hmm. Easy Pieces. And, but I also love the old films. I love the films like, uh, you know, Bogart and McCall uh, uh, and Lauren Bacall. I love, you know, like I, I come from two sort of time frames. But I would say I'm going to come up with some crazy, like probably ones you want to like. I love the epic storytelling of David Lean. Of course. I loved the storytelling of Sergio Leone. Oh, Leone. Oh, it's all good. I mean, you know, I mean, those are some of the guys that I would have to say, man, um, I don't know how you get from here to there. Like once upon, I, a, time, once upon a time uh, in the West. I mean, once upon a time, once upon a time in the, how did you know? Because once upon a time in the West was actually the film. I was with a bunch of buddies. Uh, I was at UC Berkeley and one of my guys, he was a poet and a long haired, cool, cool dude. And he said, let's get out of here. I said, well, it's finals next week. He said, yeah, that's a good reason to leave. Let's go. And we're going to hitchhike down to L.A. What, whatever the story was, it was like, OK, fine, let's go. So we went. Um, let's just say there might have been some illicit substances involved when when we were down there. Shocking. I know. And uh, we decided in that condition that we were going to go to Disneyland because it was such a logical choice. And, well, you know, the, Disneyland had a lot of very large, big boned, crew cutted, walkie talkie, blue blazered gentlemen uh, who were the, the guards of the castle. And they saw us coming a mile away. Uh, you know, our sandals, long hair, hippie outfit, and uh, like clearly not, uh, you know, entirely sober. Uh, and they wouldn't let us in. Well, long story short, what happened was we got we all pile into a car and go, oh, bummer, man. You know, <laughs> we, mm. we take 
And we're driving along and we see a movie theater and we go, that's it. We're going to go see a movie. We sit in the front row, high as a kite, and staring up at this massive screen. And what are we watching? Once Upon a Time in the West. I mean, that, that, that film is beyond genius. Well, it's Sergio Leone was a genius. I mean, what he was able to, yeah. that film just that first opening sequence. Just, yeah. The close-ups of the cast. Yeah, you don't, you don't, there's no, there's no dialogue for the first like eight minutes of the movie. And you're just like this. You're just sitting there like, oh my God, it's just music and shot. And he's telling the us. Fly, the gun barrel with the fly. Oh, stop it. It's just, <laughs> it's just, everyone listening, after you're done with this podcast, please go watch Once Upon a Time in the West. It, it, you, you won't be sorry. I mean, and then, uh, and then watch the rest of the uh, Man Without, uh, Man With No Name uh, trilogy. Uh, you, you'll, uh, you'll enjoy or, or anything with man. You, you can watch The Third Man, uh, yep. The Quiet Man with John Ford and Maureen O'Hara. Not, not bad. bad. Not bad, not bad, not bad. Yeah, there's, there's I mean, like, I always ask that question because, uh, you know, I like putting my guests on the spot because everyone's like, oh, come on, I can't, I can't, I can't. Um, but it's, I always love having these conversations because we, we, we kind of go down different roads and like, and it's always funny because, you know, I always get, you know, the Godfathers, obviously, and, you know, there's, and, you know, the Scorsese's and Spielberg stuff. And, but then every once in a while you get these kind of like out of left field conversations. And once upon a time in the West, obviously, I have, oddly enough, it's not been on. It has not in 600 episodes. It's not one of the ones that's popped up all the time. It's not one of those automatics. Um, right. But it should be because it's it's just it's it's, it's just brilliant. It's just brilliant. It's as good as it gets. But, yeah. But but, uh, but Gary, it has been a pleasure talking to you, man. It has been a real honor. Um, and I know we can keep going for at least another two three hours. We could break the record, but I think we'll stop we, today. We, <laughs> we can go for it. Alex, you're a total joy. I love listen. I love what you're doing, and I I I, I love this conversation. And I know we've only just met, but I hope to continue the conversation down the road. Absolutely, my friend. Thanks again.